Hi everyone, I'm Dave. Um, and I grew up with JavaScript, literally. JavaScript like my little brother. I was going to say JavaScript is more like my little brother than my little brother, but that is being recorded, so I'm not saying that. Um, so, <clears throat> this, uh, this whole presentation uh, has, is uh, in a system that I've been working on for present presenting. And one day I'm going to do a presentation on the presentation system. Um, but what you can do is if you go to that URL, view.nftra.in, view.nftrain, um, you can, uh, in your browser or your mobile or whatever, you can follow along with the slides and as I go through it will synchronize uh, as we go through. Um, particularly if you want to see something closer. So how many people in here do JavaScript on a daily basis? Okay. How many people use Node on a daily basis? Uh, fairly similar, fairly similar. Um, so this is this is more of a high level talk, just about where JavaScript come from comes from, and um, I had a lot of fun kind of preparing for this, and I got a bit probably too deep into into the history of it, uh, and um, what makes it powerful, and some of the things that have, have, have led to confusion around it. Um, so even if you do JavaScript every day. It, by, by, by looking a little further into the history and, and how it's put together, it can actually lead to a greater appreciation of the language and, and uh, a way to use it. Um, but in many ways, this talk will be gratuitously egotistical because I've basically interwound my own story into the story of JavaScript, and I may have got carried away at points. Um, it's basically more self-involved than a Facebook profile. And that's exactly what I look like with my shirt off. Breathe it. <laughs> Some other time. Um, but it's all, it's all a bit of fun. It's not like I have a Russell Brand complex. It's not like I have a Messiah complex. So let's get into it. In 32 BD, which for those who don't know is 32 before Dave, um, which is 1953, uh, a guy called John W. Backus gets fed up writing ASM. He was working on uh, military systems for, I think, missile launches um, for IBM. And he went to IBM with a proposal to reduce the amount of lines of code that you would have to write to make writing code easier. Um, and that proposal was Fortran. Has anyone ever coded in Fortran before? Oh my goodness, maybe you should just come up with this talk. Um, <laughs> Um, so this was obviously this was 32 years before my time, but I, had, I did hear about it in my, in my childhood. I ended up finding a book on it and flicking through it, but nothing really serious. Um, the first Fortran compiler was released in 1957 and reduced the necessary statements versus assembly by a factor of 20. Um, Fortran initially, yes it was written, but it was also, the target was the punch card. Um, and the, the punch card um, system that they used was very brittle. And for instance, if you dropped a box of punch cards, uh, punch cards, and they all got scattered, and they went into a different order, now all the lines of your code are mixed up, and you can't. You have to kind of figure out how to put them back in order. Um, so it, it was it's very brittle. And if they got damaged, um, they, you would have to re-punch the card and. Computer time was very expensive, and that's why they used punch cards. So the whole, um, basically, continuous deployment, they weren't there with it yet. Long story short. So this is an example of some Fortran, uh, when you put a C in the front, it means it into a comment, and then that whole card would become a comment. Um, other than that, it's, it's fairly straightforward what's going on. It's nice and easy to read, and of course, it's all caps because Computers uh, at that time had um, partial ASCII, uh, which was just the hundred, and, uh, which was basically just the capital letters and uh, a couple of bits of punctuation and control characters. Twenty-seven before Dave, uh, you're on the Davidian calendar, was 1958, and these, this is when two extremely important developments <coughs> happened um, in terms of uh, the history of JavaScript. Um, both Lisp and Algol were created in 1958. Has anyone heard of Algol? Mm -hmm. 
guys. Never use it. Has anyone heard of Lisp? <laughs> More people have heard of Lisp than Algol, that's interesting. Um, because Algol is really the granddaddy of... Algol pretty much is in every language today, there's, there's pieces of it. Whereas Lisp is in some languages, the more functional languages. Algol is like the, 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 the daddy of imperative programming. Um, so JavaScript, JavaScript has three ancestors, three main ancestors, Algol, Lisp, and Fortran. Uh, but Fortran is more like a step-grandfather, um, which we'll look at later. So here's an example of some Algol, again, all caps. You can see the, um, the colon equals, uh, which was, I think, I'm not exactly sure, but I know in Pascal that, that meant becomes equal to. And that kind of fed through and then got discarded somewhere along the way. Um, originally it was called the International Algebraic Language, because it, uh, and it stands for Algorithmic Language, that's what Algol stands for. So it was, it was really, it was the best language designed by committee, according to one opinion, um, ever. Uh, it was designed by some really intelligent European and American computer scientists who got together for like a, a, a week or two and put this thing together. Uh, Lisp uh, was the f first language that was used for uh, artificial intelligence programming. Um, it's a highly functional language. And the, the amazing thing about Lisp is uh, this, this concept of, let me see if I can pronounce this right, homo iconicity. Apart from Miles, does anyone know what homo iconicity is? Okay, so basically, the, the, the data structure is the same as the programming syntax. And what that means is the, the interpreter doesn't have to actually create an abstract syntax tree from the code because the code is already in the form of an abstract syntax tree. It just has to read it. And that's why there's so many parentheses in Lisp, because you have to be uh, specific about your boundaries. There's no room for interpretation. Like, you know when you do like three times four divided by two, depending on where you put the brackets in that changes which part is the expression that gets evaluated uh, at what time. Uh, but it did, it did get the nickname lots of irritating superfluous parentheses um, because of that. Something that's really cool about this as well, that, that kind of shows that it's an ancestor of JavaScript, is if you take this particular code snippet and you put it into a function, um, don't try and call the function because it will error, but it will pass correctly. That's legit JavaScript, um, which I think is kind of awesome. 1960 to 1970, <clears throat> there's a guy called Theodore Nelson. Has anyone heard of Theodore Nelson? Right, probably not. Because the Theodore Nelson was amazing at like, uh, visualizing the future and, and coining terms, but um, he never actually succeeded in, in building anything. He did, he's still trying to build things, but he never actually got anything across the line for people to go, hey, this is really cool, let's, let's work with this. Um, but he did coin a lot of terms, and the, the term that he coined in 1960 was hypertext. Um, that was the first time that, that word had ever been heard or written. In 1962, there was a creation of Simular. Anyone heard of Simular? <laughs> it was the first object-oriented programming language, um, but based on um, specialist. Uh, was it based on this? Oh, well, well, we'll see that in a minute. I've got a diagram. But basically, uh, it was for creating simulations. And prior to this, simulations had to be created by um, an algorithm that controlled the whole simulation end to end, and had to basically be like a god, a god class, if you like, that, that, that interacted with elements individually and moved them and all that. What Simula did was it, it created this idea of encapsulation of a piece of logic uh, into an object that could talk to other objects. Um, and that, that was the first time that had been done. 1964 was the creation of the original BASIC language. Um, I love BASIC. Uh, I, the first language I learned was BASIC. Uh, and what I really loved about it was uh, it delivered on its pro promise. The first, the B of BASIC is beginners. Uh, it really made it easy as, as a child um, uh, to, to understand programming concepts. And one of, one of the ways it did that was this 
uh, rapid feedback uh, that you got. You wrote a line of code and you could run it and you could see exactly what was happening um, all on that blue screen that you get. Um, and for me, JavaScript has that same property. Uh, you can open dev tools, you can try stuff out uh, before you write any code, and, and that's actually still my, my, my preferred style. Uh, in 1965, two MIT computers start communicating with packet switching. On the 5th of August 1968, there was a public demo of, of packet switching. Um, this was opposed to circuit switching. So prior to this, if a computer wanted to connect to another computer, it called the other computer up, just like you would call someone on the phone, and then you had a line uh, connected directly to them. By introducing packet switching, they essentially virtualized that, that process and allowed packets to, to go to any computer that's connected. Um, 1969, the first successful message was sent over ARPANET. Um, at 9.30, the first unsuccessful message was sent. Uh, and it, it, it crashed after, at the third character. And the first two characters were L and O. And I wish that the first message sent over the internet was LOL, here comes the interwebs, but it was actually logging. Um, but I, I, it would have been amazing if it was. Uh, 1970s, 1980s. Getting closer to the year of my birth. Uh, the 70s saw development of the actor model. I, I'm going to say, has anyone heard of the actor model? And Miles is going to put up his hand. Has anyone heard of the actor model? Yeah. Oh, another one. Um, so again, th this, th this wasn't a programming language, but this was a concept that people were exploring about uh, what, what they were calling actors uh, being able to independently uh, communicate messages to each other concurrently uh, in an asynchronous way, um, which sounds to me a lot like microservices, to be honest. Uh, but it's also kind of influential on the way that JavaScript works. Uh, in 71 to 72 ish, uh, C was uh, created. Uh, 72 to, uh, no, that's not right. Forget what I said that. 72 to 80 was the development of Smalltalk. Smalltalk was built on Simula, um, and it turned out to have some really powerful paradigms. Um, and initially, it was an educational tool, uh, but it, it was actually very good as a production language as well, and, and there's still systems around today that have been built on Smalltalk. In uh, 1974 was the first ever internet service provider called Telenet, which was a commercial, commercial version of ARPANET, and ARPANET was basically a, research, uh, a military research program. In 1978, was, there was a, a, a blizzard in Chicago. It was called the Great Chicago Blizzard. And a couple of geeks got locked in and snowed into a basement, which, as we all know, is where everything, actually, real stuff gets built in the basement. Um, and they, they cobbled together, because they, they just have what they have to hand, they cobbled together the, the first uh, ba um, BBS. Um, I forget what it stands for, something bulletin system. What was it? Uh, Pardon? That's it, thanks. Just went on my head. The bulletin board system. So, 19, so they, they did that then, and in 1979, uh, there was the first proprietary uh, consumer online service. It wasn't the internet, it was a proprietary protocol, but it was close, it's getting close. Uh, and it was called The Source. Um, and their tagline was, it's not hardware, it's not software, but it can take your personal computer anywhere in the world. Um, so <laughs> these, these concepts were kind of being driven forward. CompuServe in 1979 launched something called Micronet, which was competitive to the source, and they eventually bought the source out. And then they in turn were eventually bought out by AOL, who kind of just disappeared in the last 10 years or something. Um, I'm sure they're still around, but who uses them? Um, in 1982, the, the former basis of the band Ocean Rock, You've probably not heard of this band. Finds that most 8-bit adventure-style games are too verbose. He essentially believes that taking a subset of the good parts of a traditional adventure game will lead to an elegant and entertaining action game. He's right. After writing a medieval game originally called Night Soil, with a K, which was a joke about pooing the bed, um, Atari noticed the talent and they hired him. His name was Douglas Crockford. In 1982, Douglas Crockford wrote an 8-bit Atari game. 
Um, and you can find the, the manual for the game online with a picture of Douglas Crockford looking really young. And um, it talks about how he like plays the bass in the band and uh, how he's working on music with uh, medieval, he's composing music with medieval undertones and stuff. Uh, but like his approach back then was, there's too much, strip it down. And, and that's still his approach now. Uh, for those who know of, of Douglas Crockford. 1982 was an epic year as well because it also saw the release of Danger Mouse. In 1985, the year of my birth, uh, was the release of the Atari 65 XE, um, which I later possessed uh, uh, at about the age of 10. The first ever, the first ever registered domain uh, also happened in 1985, and it was by Symbolics.com. Anyone heard of them? They were they were huge at the time. Uh, they were the creators of Lisp. Lisp machines. Lisp machines, yeah, but right. They produced Lisp machines uh -huh. because Lisp was um, particularly heavy on 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 the, the current architectures of computers. So they actually built specialized machines, which became redundant pretty quickly after the uh, what's that law. Uh, what was that? Work? Yeah, thanks. More as well kicked in. You guys should just come up here with me. <laughs> um, Symbolics was also mentioned in Jurassic Park in the 90s as well. Um, so they're quite well known. Uh, the National Science Foundation Network uh, was launched also in, uh, the year, uh, in that year. And they had 2,000 connected computers. Something else that happened in that year was HyperCard was created and released. Anyone have a hypercard? There's a lot of nostalgia, right? Did anyone, did anyone, anyone who's heard it, did they use it? Ah, oh, shame. I would have loved to talk to someone who actually used it. Um, so hypercard was like the internet without the internet. They actually built a browser and not taken the next logical step of, of making that work across um, uh, the, the internet protocol, which hadn't, been, hadn't quite been invented yet, but it was getting there. Um, basically, you had a, a, a deck of cards, and you, you basically could define these cards, and the cards could have form elements and different things. Um, and you could interact with those cards. And they also had this concept of hyperlinks. Anyone heard of hyperlinks? It was a hypercard with hypertext that had hyperlinks. Um, and in 1986, um, they also introduced hypertalk. And if you read this, like, it's not far off from, from JavaScript or AppleScript either. On mouse down, um, answer file, please select text file to open. Uh, if it's empty, then exit mouse down, put it into a file path. Da, 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 da. And then, so it was uh, one of the earlier attempts to like create a scripting language that could interact with visual elements. Also, in 1986, was the self was uh, designed. Anyone heard of self? Oh, yeah. Miles, have you heard of self? Ah, yeah. So, um, Self was built on top of Smalltalk. And Self was Smalltalk without the classes. It was a deliberate move to take classes out of, of programming. And instead of classes, they would have an object that would essentially point to another object. And when it pointed to another object, it was called its prototype object. Sound familiar? So, um, so another thing that's, if you read the self-documentation, one of the first things it says is, everything is an object. Um, which, is, which is mostly true of JavaScript as well. Functions are objects. If you do type of null, it says object, which is a bug. If you do type of array, it says object. Um, the, even, even numbers and strings are, 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 are objects, kind of mixed, and booleans are, are objects mixed with primitives. So they have a primitive, but when you access a property on that, behind the scenes it turns it into an object and then calls that property on it as if it's an object. Um, in 1987, CompuServe introduces the GIF format, and everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> I love the words tail goes between its legs right there. <laughs> you can, I, when I was doing this, I just sat there watching it for like 30 seconds, just going, hello. Um, in 1987, I was watching Rainbow, um, and it's one of my earliest memories, but it, it was actually a really surreal experience, because no one explains puppetry to a two-year-old. I thought it was real, man. 
And I thought there was people out there like this. In 1989, TCP IP becomes the global standard for interconnected networks. Um, CERN, or CERN, don't know how to pronounce that, which was a, a nuclear research organization, um, it's a, like had a French, big French name, opens its first TCP IP ports so it can communicate with other networks that it's got going on. Um, and it, so this exposes its, its internal intranets to the world in a sense, but kind of privately as well. Also in 1989, Australian universities begin using IP protocols to unify their network infrastructure. Japan connects to NSFnet, and the first commercial dial-up access is launched. It's called world.std.com. You can go to that address today, and they still exist, and they still offer dial-up. They didn't really move on. It's funny how they were so forward-thinking, and then just stopped there. Um, and I was all like, everything is awesome. That's how I was in 1989. In 1990, the architect, architects, um, he's given a lot of credit for inventing the internet, but all of the pieces were already there. What he did, and he says this himself, is he was just like, I just put them, I just was like, oh, you can put this with this and this with that, and you've got this system that can communicate. Um, so he, he really pulled on the work of pretty much the last 60 ish years because the, the concept of the internet was probably first talked about in a book in 1938, uh, where it talked about a uh, radio library uh, that used uh, televisions and um, uh, different, uh, and uh, what was the other thing, and phone networks uh, to, uh, to uh, communicate information. Um, so like that, that concept was around from about 1938. He, uh, he put, he, for example, some of the things he did was he, he took SGM, SGML, which is Standardized Generalized Market Language, and created HTML from it. Um, he, he takes HTTP and the, the notion of hypertext um, and, and puts a protocol on top of TCP IP and DNS and all that kind of stuff. Um, and to demonstrate these concepts that he's worked on, he starts creating something called the World Wide Web Browser, which was later called Nexus. Um, but it was limited to one platform, which was uh, the BSD flavored Next computers, as launched by Steve Jobs whenever he got kicked out of Apple and then merged back into OSX. In 1991, sorry, um, the High Performance Computing and Communications Act supplies funding to the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And that's significant because what they did with that money was build a web browser called Mosaic. Also in 1991, I got a Christmas present, um, and I was about six. Um, honestly, at that time, I found the Choo Choo Train more interesting that I got as a Christmas present. But I had a babysitter, and I haven't seen him since I was six, um, but he, he looked something like this. I'm not exaggerating, this is what he looked like. Um, I, like, maybe not quite exactly the same face, but had the dreadlocks, he was totally a stoner, and um, he was my big sitter. Um, I called him Michael Blackhead, but that wasn't actually his name. Uh, I don't know why I called him that. So, I kind of identify with JavaScript, because both myself and JavaScript have colorful and somewhat obscure backgrounds. Um, and this is what he showed me, in fact, um, I'm going to do it live because there's just something about about doing it. Um, if I if I can find my come on, where are you? Here we go. Here we go. Just a second. Should have had this prepared. Cool. So this was when you turned on the Commodore 64. The first thing you had was a command prompt. And that was amazing, that was an amazing thing. Because it made you interact with it on a, the level of, essentially, of the, the level of a coder. And so he turned it on and he said, and he went, watch this. Ten print David, twenty, go to ten, run. And I was astounded. <laughs> because the thing was, I just learned to write my name. And I was like, I'm not going to have to write my name ever again. <laughs> and that's why my handwriting is terrible. In 
1992, work begins on Mosaic, uh, which is actually a multi-protocol client. It's not just an HTTP client, they support Gopher and FTP and different protocols at the time because they didn't know which one was going to win. So let's just support them all. Um, and, and that's a good approach because not only were they multi-protocol, multi they're also multi-platform. So it worked on Unix, Windows, and Macintosh. And that is probably what led to the success of Mosaic or the influence of Mosaic. Because it wasn't the first and it maybe wasn't even the best browser. Uh, what was going for it was the, the multi-platform capability. Um, which even today is, is leveraged uh, by us. Because when we, when we write a JavaScript web app, it's multi-platform because we know it's going to run on browsers and on plat platforms, including mobile devices. Um, the initial launch enabled the ability to inline images uh, using the image tag. And Tim Berners-Lee did not like that. But they did it anyway, because they were like, hey, this would be really cool. And that was one of the things that made people love it. Because even though um, uh, it was kind of crappy, they could at least put some visuals in that made it look kind of how they wanted to make it look. Because people love being about the visuals. Like you could be working on some awesome algorithm, right, that does some awesome thing. And you try and explain it to someone like, yeah, 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 yeah. But you create something visual, like, I don't know, with WebGL, and they're like, whoa! And even, even programmers are like that, but definitely like non-programmers won't. And so sometimes that leads to projects being done in weird ways, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, kind of, you put on the polish before there's anything to polish. Um, so, uh, so this this dynamic and, and what some would have called reckless approach uh, of just doing whatever they wanted regardless of the spec doesn't sound familiar, does it? Um, led to some innovations. Uh, one of the inno inno innovations was the blink tag. So not everything that was everything that came out of that was good. But another thing that did come out of it that was good was the script tag. Because essentially none of that was in the spec. It was supposed to be a document format, not an application format. And that's why we use a document format to create web apps today. At the same time there was something called the Erwise browser. The Erwise browser was written by uh, some Finnish people. And all the co code comments and all the documentation was written in Finnish, but it was the first browser to underline text links. Um, and it was a really nice implementation. And Tim Berners-Lee tried to pick it up and tried to work with it, but he couldn't speak Finnish. So he would get to the point and he'd go, I can't work with this because I can't understand the documentation to do what I need to do. Um, also, in that year, I got me a Mega Drive. <coughs> and whilst it was awesome, um, uh, well, I love playing Sonic. Anyone else love Sonic? I love Sonic. Until I fell out with Sonic. Because uh, at, at some point, there, were, there, there would be bugs in the game. And you, you'd be like at a crucial point, and something would happen. Like it would freeze for a second or something, and you'd get killed. And in the mind of a seven year old, six year old, whatever it was, that is cheating. It was cheating. So after it cheated me the, the 40th or 50th time, I flew it, threw it in a bowl of water. Uh, and realized that's how water affects electrical items. Um, but it, it, it's a crucial shift between generations. So I was fortunate to be at the end of the generation of the Commodore 64 and the Atari and the Spectrum and all of that, where you had an interface that you, you interacted with at a, at basically at a code level. Even if you wanted to play a game, you had to write run tape. Um, but when you started having these console games, it's purely about entertainment. You turn it on and you press start and you start playing. And again, the, the, it's, that's been up to the, the, the iPads, a lot of kids using iPads and just being consumers instead of creators. So my, my development was affected early, early on um, by this idea that you can create stuff like at a low level with computers instead of um, at a high level. In 1993, uh, Mosaic was released to the public. Um, also in 1993, 
I change stepdads because my current stepdad goes to jail because he's a drug dealer. Um, and my new stepdad, he likes to go to boot fairs, so I'm up really early on the weekends uh, going to boot fairs. And I get a couple of quid pocket money a week. And by this time, Ataris were not, you know, not expensive at all. You could pick them up for a quid from a boot fair. So I ended up picking up um, a lot of these things. I had every single one of these and more. Uh, but that was, that was my favorite one. That was, for me, that was the most ergonomically comfortable Atari. Um, these were okay. I think I had that one, but it didn't ever work. And that one was interesting because it had a cartridge, but I never found a cartridge that would work with it. And that one was interesting because, it, it, well, for one thing, it was the most embarrassing looking one. Um, but you could, you could play this game. You were supposed to attach a keyboard to it, but I didn't know that. So I was like, how did you work with this? <laughs> and, uh, but if you, press the, if you press a certain button combination, it would start a game, and you could play a game with the buttons, and it would shoot like a line, like this, and it would be a big line that would just shoot. It's kind of like a Space Invader style thing, except you're like a little cannon and you shoot things. Um, and the, things could, the enemies could fly into the line. And obviously at that time, you're like, this is amazing graphics, you know. Um, 1993, Mosaic was the Republic, done that one. 1994, uh, a new company is formed, and they're called Mosaic Communications Corporation. A couple of guys who worked on the Mosaic browser, including Mark Anderson, if anyone's heard of him, go and start this company. And the, the institution they came from was like, no, we're not happy of you calling yourselves Mosaic, that's our thing. So they renamed themselves to the Next, Netscape Communications Corporation. They rewrite Mosaic from scratch, and they call it Mosaic Netscape, um, which is then renamed shortly after to Netscape Navigator. But the internal name has always been had always been at Netscape for all of the years that they were around. They always called it Mozilla. It was a portmanteau for Mosaic Killer, because their idea was to kill the old Mosaic browser and with a commercial browser. Um, in that year as well, Spyglass purchased. Uh, NCSA's Mosaic, and also rewrote all the code from scratch. Because by this time, to support the three platforms, they pretty much had three code bases. So they wanted to create one shared code base. They, they purchased the rights to use the Mosaic name for millions of pounds. Um, personally, I now live in a house and it's got a basement. And as I said earlier, basements is where stuff gets done. So I have uh, an old TV screen down there, and I have an Atari hooked up to it, and I have a basic programming book that I've ordered at a booth there, uh, and, I, and I start working through it. So I'm nine years old, and I'm, and I'm getting this education, uh, learning basic. Start of the browser wars. Browser, browser wars the first was in that year. December 1994, Netscape was born. And they, they declare that it's free for non-commercial use. In 1995, Netscape say, wait, hold on, it's not free for non-commercial use. It's free for educational and non-profits. But everyone else has to pay. Um, in that year, Brendan Eich, has anyone heard of Brendan Eich? Yeah, yeah. Um, for, for various reasons. Um, he, he started consulting with Netscape. And he designs JavaScript in, does anyone know, want to know how long it took him to design JavaScript? 10 days, yeah. See, talking to JavaScript developers, everyone knows this, these, these ones, and it's just like 10 days. You guys are 10 days. We all know it's only 10 days. In that year, I, 1995, I ruined my grandma's education. Um, at this point, I'm living with my grandparents, and she has this old IBM PC. Um, it's like a green screen PC with like some esoteric operating system I've never seen before. I'd seen DOS PCs and stuff before, but it wasn't DOS. It might have been, it must have been Unix, I guess. Um, and she'd been doing a college course using this PC. Um, and it's, it's, it, there, was this, there was this thing you could do with it, it had a drawing application where you basically drew in like big green blocks. Um, and I would draw stuff with that and things. So, but anyway, I'm addicted to this machine. So like it's two or three hours a day after school, I'm going on this green screen computer. I don't think it was good for my eyes. Um, and eventually, I managed to break it irreparably because 
this was how I learned stuff. I broke things, and then I was like, oh, that's how it works, you know. Um, so my grandma loses all of her coursework and never finishes the course. Um, but she replaces the IBM PC with a 386 machine with Windows 3.1. Uh, and the person that they got this machine from was an IT teacher, not in my school, some other school, uh, called Mr. Bean. That was his name, his name was Mr. Bean. I remember it clearly, um, for obvious reasons. But I would, I would play around with this machine and I would every now and again just completely break it and go, how do I fix this? And then Mr. Bean would come around and fix it for me. Um, in 1995 as well, Internet Explorer is born. And they enter a license agreement with Spyglass, remember? Spyglass uh, bought the rights for millions of dollars to use the name Mosaic and didn't even use the source code. Um, they enter a license agreement. So Netscape's model is sell the browser to the public. Spyglass's model is license it to third party uh, to uh, third party vendors. So another of their customers was AOL. And um, the, the deal was for every copy of Internet Explorer that Windows sells, they'll get sales, they'll get a percentage, they'll get a royalty fee. Except Microsoft never did sell Internet Explorer, did they? They just bundled it with their operating system and said it was free. Spyglass later sued them for eight million dollars. Ten days. So this is the ingredients behind JavaScript. Um, it's made up of Scheme, uh, which is where it gets its first class of functions from. Scheme is a, a descendant of Lisp. It's made up of Self, which is where it gets its prototypal model from, and Java, which is where it gets its obligatory syntax. Because basically, what they wanted to do, or what Brandon wanted to do, was implement Scheme in the browser bringing some ideas of self into it. And it probably would have had a syntax that looks more like those languages. Um, however, Netscape were basically in a very cozy relationship with Sun at the time, and Sun's flagship project was Java. So they were like, dude, you've got to make it look like Java, because we've got to keep this guys happy. So the Java syntax is, is, is not because because it was an amazing idea, it's because of a political reason. And that's okay, but it, 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 do, it has led to some issues which we may not have had, plenty of issues which we may not have had, if it had been a different syntax. So here's a bigger diagram of the JavaScript heritage. Um, so we, we come from uh, Lisp, which leads into uh, Scheme, which goes into JavaScript. Lisp also feeds into Smalltalk, um, and our goal feeds into Simula, which feeds into Smalltalk. And Smalltalk kind of inspired the Act model, um, and Smalltalk goes into self into JavaScript, uh, and then our goal uh, goes into Pascal uh, and CPL. Now, CPL was the first language to use curly braces. That's where we get the curly braces from that ended up being in C, that ended up being in JavaScript, that ended up being in JavaScript. Uh, on top of it, CPL led to BCPL, which led to B, and, and B was kind of a combination of BCPL and Fortran, uh, and Pascal and B fed into C, and then C went to C++, which went to Java, which went to JavaScript. So it's kind of interesting to see all of the kind of languages that, that fed into the making of, so JavaScript in the early days was, was sort of was just like this toy language, and it's just been thrown together, but really it has a very rich heritage. So in 1996, things started to speed up. Um, Netscape 2 and Netscape 3 are released in the same year, and with it JavaScript 1 and 1.1. Also in that year, IE3 was released with uh, JScript. They could call it JavaScript because they would get sued. Because Java uh, was a trademark of Sun. It's now a trademark of Oracle. So they reverse engineered JavaScript, faithfully, faithfully re reproduced every single bug that existed in the language, and called it JScript. Um, later on, 
because, because they'd done that, when it came to standardizing the language, they insisted that those bugs remain in the language. So a lot of stuff could have been fixed early on had it not been for Microsoft's insistence that, no, this is how it should be. But there were bugs. Um, by, by, by this point, the typical response to JavaScript was, JavaScript sucks. Um, but, as someone pointed out later, JavaScript has sucky parts, and there is a difference. So why does it have sucky parts? Well, the first reason was they wanted it to be newbie friendly. Um, so one of the decisions that was made for the friendliness to newcomers was implicit closures. E.g., when you don't declare your variable, it goes onto the global scope. So it tried to be like as as uh, it tried to cover kind of syntactical mistakes and different things like that. But that turned out to be a really bad idea. Another reason was the Java syntax, because the Java syntax uh, led to a lot of confusion. JavaScript is not a class-based language, and Java is. So to make it look like Java, you had to make it look like a class-based language. So then when people would try to use it like a class-based language using new and this and all of those kind of things, they came up against all of these uh, oddities and problems and unexpected behaviors because they're not used to a, like a dynamic runtime language that's prototypal in nature, uh, behaving like, like it does. Um, people creating big, massive hierarchies, and there's like hardly any debugging tools for dealing with that sort of thing. Um, so that's another reason why it sucked, and still sucks in some ways. Uh, the other reason it was rushed, just on 10 days, and that's why type was not this object, because it was a rushed decision. Uh, in the end of 1996, Netscape submitted JavaScript to ECMA. In June 1997, EmScript 1 is released. ECMA was the European Computer Manufacturers Association, but they ended up being less about hardware and more about standardization. Um, they called it ECMAScript because, as I said, Java is a trademark term, so they couldn't call it JavaScript. Um, so they called it ECMAScript, and as someone said at the time, it sounds like a skin disease. <laughs> it's probably one of the worst named languages, and that's why we still call it JavaScript. Um, it was called ECMA 262. So version 1 was in 1997, and then version 2 was released in 1998. But version 2 was just minor alterations to help make it fit into an ISO format, so that it could be an ISO standard as well as an ECMA standard, and it still is an ISO standard. Um, uh, ES2 was implemented in IE4 and Netscape 4, as you can see here. One of the two hard things, one of the two hard things in computer science, yeah, yeah. naming things and caption validation. Um, the first name was clearly the, the name that it should have had. Mocha. Perfect. Short. Um, kind of rolls off the tongue, you get a bit of a in the back of your throat with mocha, but it's kind of a soft, so you can, you can kind of nice to say. It's a chocolatey drink, you know, feels good. Um, and this was proposed by Mark Anderson. However, the marketing department came along and decided they wanted to call it LiveScript, because that fit with their portfolio of marketing products at that time. And uh, Brendan Knight put it like this, it made me throw up in the back of my throat. Um, it was then called, renamed to JavaScript because of the pandering to some. Um, and Microsoft called it JScript as a trademark issue, and eventually it was known as ECMAScript. At least they didn't, well, it could have been called ISOScript if they had gone to ISO first. ISOScript, ISOScript, ECMAScript, ISOScript. ISOScript is nicer, I think. Only just. Um, in 1997 to 1998, I was ringing up a phone bill of about £300 a month. Um, dial up when it first came out, when I was about 12, was actually really expensive. Um, so my mum wasn't happy about that, obviously. She was a single parent too. Um, so she was like, you need to do something about this. So I developed a strategy. And the strategy was, pick a website that I want to go onto, dial up, go to the website, and hang up. And I would do this and dial up for this action right here. This is this is HTML goodies. I don't know if anyone remembers this site or one on this site. Yes? Yes. 
Did you learn JavaScript from this site? Um, maybe. <laughs> so it's by a guy called Joe Burns, PhD. It's still around, it's got a new design. I got this from the Wayback Machine. It had a JavaScript section, and it taught you to write JavaScript. Really, really poor JavaScript. Um, <laughs> globals everywhere and everything, but, um, but that's, that's, that's how it was, you know. Um, so I would dial up, load a page, go offline and then and then and then play with the, the what was what was being spoken about, try my own examples and kind of milk it for about an hour and then dial up and, and hang up again. The, the only the only issue with that was the most expensive part of the phone call was the initial connection. And the thing was as well is BT were terrible with their infrastructure. It took four or five attempts to dial up and actually get the connection. So you're probably spending maybe 50p four or five times to get the connection, and then it would have been a couple of pence per minute after that. Um, I was also on, I don't know if I remember this, um, when, I, when I did this in London, no one remembered it apart from the lady to my left. Um, Neopets, you remember Neopets? Come on, there's one person, one person. Did you have, tell me this, did you have a Neopet? Below my eighth grade, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I had two Neopets. <laughs> but um, I think it was more popular among girls. Um, so no. <laughs> um, I also played one to two a lot around that period. 1998, Netscape open sources their code base and they call it Mozilla. Um, and the tagline is Free the Lizard, uh, which is a innuendo. In 2000, um, I became more oriented towards the visual. I got a little bit fed up uh, with the limitations of JavaScript. And I started using um, uh, Delphi, Object Pascal, to create like Windows applications and stuff, just for, my, just for playing around and stuff. And I also started using Flash and ActionScript, and I built a website in Flash and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, and I played it up. Also in the year 2000, IE 5.5 uh, supported ECMAScript third edition. So ES3, which is the one that we then used for like the next 10 to 12 years, um, added regular expressions, better string handling, uh, what else, uh, new control statements, try-catch exception handling, um, which is a shame because try-catch is, is a fine idea, but it's another example of trying to place a paradigm that works better in a static compiled language than it does in a dynamic runtime language is asynchronous. Um, and I think it's still, it's V8 will still uh, find it hard to work with try, try catch. It de optimizes your function when you use it. So I wish they could come up with a better way. But um, there was also new uh, formatting numeric output and a couple of other enhancements. But it wasn't a major amount. The ECMAScript 2 was actually pretty powerful as it was. Uh, in 2000, Netscape 6 is released, Netscape 5, and it is not good. Um, basically, because they uh, released the source code, when everyone saw the source code, they were like, this is crap, <laughs> we're going to rewrite it. Which is, which is actually kind of a typical developer reaction. It, doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter how good the source code is of, of a thing. When you see it, you go, this is crap, I should rewrite it. Um, but so they had they, they were they were very much in an immature stage when they released Netscape 6. It was backwards, um, and they released it because they were under pressure. Because Microsoft had released IE5, the support ES, uh, ES3, and they were just about to release IE6. So they rushed this out the door, uh, the open source community, and it, it pretty much flopped. 2001, IE6 uh, is released, and it still supports just ES3. No changes, JavaScript innovation from here on out is pretty much done for a good long time. As is browser innovation for a while. Netscape market share goes down to 9% in 2001 and peters out to nothing by 2004. Um, because people just migrated to IE6 had won the war, basically. 2002, this guy, I'm sure plenty of people recognize this guy, launches JSON.org. And that facilitates the rise of Ajax because it defines a format that's so simple that can be easily implemented in every language. Um, and it's perfect for JavaScript because it's essentially a subset of JavaScript objects. 
You can just copy and paste some JSON and then make it into an object. It's really nice. Um, it took 11 years, 2013, before JSON actually became a standard. When he first released it in 2002, the XML peoples, which was most peoples back then, were like really tribal about it, and they were like, "Why are you trying to ruin our way of life?" You know, um, if, if there were a country, they would have started bombing them and stealing their oil and things. Um, but in 2013, it was standardized, and it was called ECMA 404, as in the spec that should have been there the whole time. Um, I, in 2002, I was about 17, and for various reasons, mainly to do with not having enough money, I didn't have any internet for like a couple of years. And I, didn't, I had a computer, I got a Linux computer, and I had a Linux magazine, I learned Linux. Um, which was nice, and I didn't have the internet to distract me, so I got kind of deep into that kind of thing, side of things. But, I, but interestingly enough, I was pretty much offline most of the time between 2002 and 2007. And in that period of time, there was hardly anything that happened with JavaScript. That's why I think I'm like the Messiah of JavaScript. No, uh, the, the, the Russell Brand of JavaScript. <laughs> no, it, it, it is interesting that like, I, I didn't miss anything in that space. Um, so around 2007, maybe 2006 a little bit for me, I started making websites voluntarily. Um, and it used PHP. I used PHP to build these websites. Um, at that point, I worked at McDonald's, and I started working in a homeless hospital. Just moved over to Northern Ireland. In that year as well, the ECMAScript 4 white paper was launched, and it was not well received. There was lots of politics and grandstanding, um, lots of different opinions and directions. Uh, it wasn't well thought out. Um, it didn't understand the, 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 the nature of JavaScript. It was written by generally seemed to be written by people who wanted to take it into the classical Java-esque direction and it would lose those, that rich heritage from scheme and self and the, the power of, of, of functions and, and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't an evolution of the language, it was a, cre a complete reimagining. And the thing that made it stupid was that it would break the web completely. Um, so in 2008, this guy releases this book uh, and really helps the industry by doing that. Has anyone read this book? Yeah. Has anyone not read this book? Who does JavaScript? It's worth a read. It's worth a read because it's so small and pretty much everything you need to know is like in the book. Um, you don't have to agree with everything he says, but it at least gives you kind of a thing to work around. You probably don't need to read it, Mars. Mars is a genius, by the way, everyone. Um, in 2008, as well, Google launched Chrome. And the significant thing about this, well, they've got a significant thing, and that they become a major challenger to IE. Firefox was kind of challenging them, but they were really the underdog. When Google got involved, they became a big contender. But one of the reasons they became such a contender was their JavaScript engine. V8. Um, V8 uh, was a performance revolution because JavaScript is like does so much stuff for you. It's it's very high level and it's dynamic. So a naive implementation was always going to be slow. But a bunch of really smart guys got together and they wrote a highly uh, optimized VM for JavaScript. And when they did that, they proved that JavaScript can be useful growing up production level language. In that year as well, TC39, the technical committee, moves in a new direction. They go with, so, Eric 4, that people trying to do Eric 4, and then a part of the TC39 was like, yeah, we're just going to do 3.1, uh, and just very slightly extend the language instead of completely reinvent it. They were making a point. Uh, by calling it 3.1, it's like we, we shouldn't be like completely changing this, we should be extending it gently. These guys were catalysts to making that happen, uh, Doug Crockford and Brendan Ike, and, and they both, mainly Brendan, actually let out that shift in thinking, and that, that shift towards like, let's recognize the language for the power that it has, and build on that. 
at the same time, they introduced ES Next, which was ES6. And a lot of that was actually political as well, because the ES4 people, diehards, they were basically able to placate them by, by, it wasn't called ES6 back then, but they were like, after we do 3.1, the next one, we're going to like incorporate some of the ideas and kind of gives us more time to think about that. So in a way, ES6 actually does come from ES4, but it's been adapted to the point that it doesn't break everything. Uh, and also, mostly, hopefully, mostly, recognizes a lot of the original power of JavaScript and the, the prototype of nature, but not everything. In 2009, ECMAScript 3.1 becomes ECMAScript 5, and the uh, final approval draft is released. Still a draft, though. Uh, 2009, Ryan Dahl creates Node, Node.js. Um, and this really added to the momentum of JS innovation, both in the language and, and in applications of JS JavaScript. Like, what, can, what else can we do with it? Uh, if I can do it on the server side, can I, can I embed it in hardware? Um, so on and so forth. So it really opened up a lot of ideas, a lot of infinite innovation, and that increased interest in JavaScript helped to fuel the, uh, the standardization process as well and move that forward. So it's a really great thing for JavaScript. Um, in the same year, three, Firefox 3.5 is released, and, and the other Firefoxes were okay, but it was significant in 3.5 because it came with SpiderMonkey, and SpiderMonkey was basically comparable to V8 as a performant JavaScript engine. 2009 as well, Chris Williams organizes the first uh, JS Conf. Uh, you may know him as Voodoo Tiki God. Um, this is significant because the community interest, again, helps to drive innovation and innovation helps to drive community interest. So it is just starting to create positive cycles. Um, Chris Williams in the same year also wrote some note, writes some note serial port, and that triggers the beginning of the rise of JavaScript robots. Um, he's a really productive guy. He, like, whilst he's doing all of this stuff, he runs like a flower shop year round as well. It's kind of a random guy. In 2011, ECMAScript 5.1 is the final standard of ECMAScript 5, fixes a couple of bugs, uh, and gets released. Uh, and with it we have strict mode. Everyone know about strict mode by now, I'm sure? Uh, it basically, you put a string literal saying strict mode, and it changes your behavior a little bit, making it so that you can't do things like uh, create physical globals, um, you can't use with, eval works differently because it, because it can't uh, create uh, variables outside of the scope of the eval. Um, we get some nice functional uh, methods on the array objects, some nice stuff on objects, the, ob the, the object constructor um, that allow you to do things like freeze the object, uh, creating immutable objects and so forth. Uh, string gets trim, that kind of should have been there a long time ago. Um, when I read that I was like, oh I thought trim was always there, but it's not. So you, if, you, if you ever have to support an on ES5 browser, you actually do have to uh, uh, polyfill uh, trim if you're using it. Uh, and then function bind uh, comes along as well. Um, if you're using function bind a lot, you might want to rethink that because it's actually kind of an expensive thing to do. And also, uh, Douglas Crockett was on the committee, and there's no way that ES5 wasn't going to get a JSON native parser, right? So JSON, uh, the uh, we get the native JSON object as well because it's passing and string like capabilities. In 25, Chris Williams again creates the unofficial JS logo. I'm sure you've all seen this logo before. Um, it's not like an official logo. Um, one thing that he says about it is, is he says it's not a JavaScript logo because that would be a trademark infringement. It's a JS logo. Um, but this becomes the, the basis of a lot of um, m many things that are written on JavaScript like uh, node bots and stuff, they tend to use this kind of branding theme. Um, Johnny Five, for instance. In the same year, shameless plug becomes a fairly common idiom. Um, and a guy called David Mark Clements writes no cookbook. Um, I was working in a homeless hostel while I wrote this, and we had 12-hour um, uh, shifts, uh, starting at 8 p.m., finishing at 8 a.m. And if, as long as everyone wasn't going nuts that night and there wasn't like a lot of drug and alcohol fueled activity, I would have a couple of hours of quietness where I could kind of really go deep um, and not be disturbed by anyone and, and, and write this thing. Um, 
Fun times. So in 2013, Node reaches version 0.8, and um, early adopters in the enterprise begin to use it in production. In 2014, Node reaches 0.10, and it's good, stable, all-round improvements, not difficult to upgrade from 0.8 to 0.10, not really any significant breaking changes. I have to update, update Node Cookbook in 2010 as well, because things have moved so fast. When it got published, it was out of date, pretty much. The day it was published, I was like, right, something's just been released and now it's out of date. Um, since then, it slowed down a little bit and uh, it's still kind of relevant, but now with all these IOJS developments and so on, I'm probably going to have to update it again in maybe six months' time. Uh, at the end of, uh, what year is it now, 2014, the end of last year, is the IOJS walk. Um, everyone been following the story of IOJS? Not just some, but not others. So IOJS uh, was a fork of Node um, due to developer discontent, essentially. Um, the stewards of, of Node joint were seen as um, being inhibitive to the project. For instance, there would be pull requests and issues, and they would just not be dealt with for months on end. Um, the the, the 0.10 had been around for too long in the minds of developers and 0.12 should have been here by now, and nothing was happening, and so it, it, it led to some of the core um, developers spinning off a project. What they actually did initially was they created a repo, a private GitHub repo called Node Forward, as in like, let's work on the next version of Node. Um, but Joint went and said to them, that's a trademark infringement. We have to protect our trademark. Node is our trademark. Um, which became, which was led to it became being called IOJS, which actually is a way more awesome name than Node. But we're gonna we're gonna end up sticking with Node um, because of because of reasons, right? Like I wrote Node Cookbook, I didn't write IOJS Cookbook, so it'd be bad for me <laughs> for a start. And that's just a small piece of the whole thing, very very small piece. Um, the enterprise is bought into the Node brand. If they put the names together, it would be Nodio. Nodio, yeah. Nodio. Nodio. Like a rodeo. Yes, like a rodeo. Instead of, so instead of like <laughs> yeah, yeah. a conference, you'd have a rodeo. So it would be Nodio the, Rodeo. Nodio Rodeo, yeah. The same my first Nodio, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in 2015, recently, quite recently, is that the, the, the Node Foundation um, was put together, and a, an agreement between IOJS and Node uh, came about for them to merge. So we've actually had the best ending to that story. Um, if you look at other communities where stuff like this has happened, people have lawyered up, spent lots of money on lawyers and things, and, and lots of bitchiness and stuff. In this case, it was really handled with maturity, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see that they're actually going to start feeding in. So um, in 2015 as well. Node was 0.12 was released. Um, more because of the pressure of IOGS that caused it to be released. Um, I would still personally be a little bit skeptical of 0.12. I'm still using 0.10 in production. Um, but if I was looking at doing something progressive, I would use IOGS. Like IOGS isn't just adding features, um, like uh, upgrading to the latest V8, so you have some ES6 features. Um, it's also doing things like, there was a new release today, I think, either today or yesterday. Um, and they've reduced the amount of syscalls that are required uh, called mates, which will improve uh, initialization performance when you have lots and lots of requires. Um, so they're doing some really nice stuff in the, in, in the areas of optimization as well. Um, and now that, the, that we have proper foundations, um, I, have, I initially didn't have much confidence about IOJS for the future because um, uh, I was a little bit unsure about whether it would end off going in, in, in a different direction or, uh, or start reducing the quality of the code and things like that. Um, but it, it really does look like they're, they're doing a great job. Uh, and it seems like what they're going to probably do is actually just feed their innovation into Node and then Node will be like the enterprise product. product. They're also going to, uh, part of the, the the, the documents of the foundation define uh, a long-term release strategy as well. 
So um, at the minute, I think 0 0.10 would be considered LTS. Uh, I might be wrong about that. So they'll actually have something they're going to support for several years for enterprise and then they have all the innovation for the new stuff. Um, let's look for 2015 at the, the, the landscape of JavaScript. I have two, two slides for this. Now this is just through my lens. I probably missed a bunch of stuff. If you think of anything, let me know because I, I want to kind of maintain these diagrams. These diagrams were produced with some called Mermaid JS. As I said, I, this is a, the presentation system that I've written uses Markdown. Um, and Mermaid.js is kind of like a markdown-like format for creating diagrams. Uh, so we have uh, V8, which led to Chromium and Chrome, and is also the engine of Node. And then Node forged into I.O. And Chromium and I.O. Uh, are, the, are the basis of NWJS and Electron. Has anyone heard of NWJS and Electron? So, Again, this presentation system is built with NWJS, and it's a combination of the Chrome and I.O., or Node, if you like, environment. So it allows you to create like desktop applications using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Node APIs. Electron's the same, but they have a, like the, uh, the way that they embed them together is like the opposite. I can't remember the details, but they have a different kind of way about it. Electron is the the uh, the basis of the Atom editor by GitHub. Um, I think Facebook have just released like an IDE uh, written in Atom as well. Um, whereas NWJS is developed by Intel. Um, Node Serial Core, which I mentioned, uh, was written by was a module written a native module written by Chris Williams, um, has opened up by 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 this year has opened up so many possibilities to do with robotics and automation. Uh, there's a project called Cylon.js, uh, which is a, a really, really nice uh, community project that tries to create like a standard way of dealing with lots and lots of different robotic devices. And they have a module for everything. What they do is they try and find someone who's already written a module that interfaces with a certain thing. And then they, they build a, their own kind of uh, standardized way of dealing uh, with uh, robotics. Uh, around that module. Um, also, 2014, 2015 uh, saw the rise of node copter events, uh, where you get like quadcopter and you can program it to do stuff. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Substack, but one of the things he did with it, uh, more so in 2014, uh, was it 2013 even, uh, was he, he would take a, a red rag and the quadcopter would charge at the rag and he'd pull it out of the way. It was like you know, kind of a cool thing to do with it. Um, and, and this just has generally led to the, the rise of, of, of no robotics, but in, in, in the way that you communicate to them over a serial port. Um, or over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, it's all pretty much amounts to the same kind of deal that starts with a serial port. Um, but what, what also has fed into the robotics movement is the Tesla. Have you heard of the Tesla? So the Tesla doesn't implement V8. It's actually um, it actually has its own runtime environment called T1 runtime, and T1 runtime is Node compatible. So you can you can put Node modules on the Tesla. Uh, so this this is nice because it gives you this kind of unified uh, approach to you can just write it like your own service like code. Um, the Esprit Node as well has its own, which is another. Um, Sorry, I should mention the Tesla is kind of like an Arduino uh, kind of deal, but it runs JavaScript. It also now supports Python and Lua, I think. Um, Esprino is, is, is like a, a much uh, lower capacity device um, with not a great JavaScript uh, uh, runtime, to be honest. And then finally, V8 feeds into Runtime.js. Has so anyone heard of Runtime.js? Really exciting project. Runtime JS. The, the goal of it is to create a, a, a kernel that runs on bare metal. So the kernel will be implemented. Well, apologies. The, the kernel, the very very low level stuff, will be implemented in C++ to communicate to the hardware. But then the stuff around that, like the network stack and all that kind of stuff, is implemented in, in JavaScript. Um, so you have like fully asynchronous operating system. Um, every every 
uh, all of the input and outputs of the operating system will operate in an asynchronous fashion. Whereas current systems that we have, uh, a lot of the APIs uh, that, that are at a low level are actually synchronous. Um, so it could be really interesting. It also has some stuff to do with isolating context and, and, and sandboxing things in a really nice way. Um, it's very, very early days, but that, that could lead to some really cool embedded hardware stuff as well. Um, and even uh, operating systems. Take a look at runtime there, it's a really interesting project. We also have, not to leave out the Microsoft world, we have Chakra, which is the JavaScript engine for IE, and also the JavaScript engine for Edge, which is going to be a completely new, amazing browser because it has a new name. <laughs> Um, and the Windows apps also use the Chakra JavaScript engine. JavaScript engine. Um, the SpyMonkey JavaScript engine obviously fuels Firefox and also Firefox OS, which is like a mobile operating system, so you can run all your JavaScript and mobile. It also feeds into GJS, I bet you've not heard of GJS. Um, it's the JavaScript engine for GNOME. So a lot of GNOME is actually written in JavaScript. Didn't know that, did you? Um, and then uh, the, there's something called JX Core. Remember that? JX Core is a Node compatible project that uses SpyMonkey. Whereas Node's goal is, to, is mainly to be for network server side applications, JX Core's goal is again to be for like embedded hardware and, and mobile apps and things like that. But then you can write them uh, with a, uh, a Node API, any of the Node modules and so forth. Um, both Chakra and SpiderMonkey, SpiderMonkey originally did this, support the use ASM uh, uh, mode. ASM is uh, like an assembly form of JavaScript. It's like a subset of JavaScript that's highly performing. Um, you tend not to write this yourself. Uh, there's, a, there's a program called mscripten, which will compile a C uh, program or a C++ program into JavaScript, um, and um, it, it does that in a very kind of raw way. Doesn't really use closures a lot and things like that. Um, so, what what they did to, to support that and, and really be able to like optimize for it is you have a function and you put a string at the top, just like you have use strict. You would have use ASM, and then everything in that function. The, the JavaScript engine will flip into a highly optimized mode that ignores a, a, a large amount of the language and just focuses on this subset. Um, V8 don't support use ASM because they have a different kind of thinking around it and they're like, well, we're not going to support it as a, as a thing, but we are going to optimize very heavily for it. So with V8, if you don't have the use ASM thing, or if you do, it doesn't make any difference. It will, it will run as fast as it can run. Um, so there's actually um, uh, game engines, modern game engines, that have been compiled to ASM and they run at 60 FPS in the browser uh, on an on a average level uh, machine. So it's kind of proven that you can write really performant code with, with JavaScript as long as you're generating it with something else. Um, and this is this is this has led to a really really exciting development that was announced like four days ago um, by Brendan Ike, which is WebAssembly. Has anyone heard of this yet? Um, and this is really really cool because it's going to be a binary format for the web, uh, which is going to be cross compatible with ASM. So you can polyfill it with ASM.js. And the thing about ASM.js is like even if the browser doesn't support ASM. It's a subset of JavaScript, so even if it's an old browser, it would still probably run. Probably not very quickly, but it would run. Um, so you have this, this path where you can go right into this binary format. Um, so uh, uh, a comparison to this would be if you were back in the, the, the olden days when you were like a C programmer, and uh, you just not, or a C++ programmer, and you're just not getting what you want from the language, and you can drop down into assembly code and actually edit the assembly code. Um, and, and we're going to actually be able to do this with JavaScript. We're going to be able to, to use the high level powerful features of the language until we're like, no, right now I need to go into something lower level. And we can access that using WebAssembly. 
The other thing, of course, is that you're going to be able to compile any language to this WebAssembly format. Um, so the same way that you can compile C++ programs to ASMJS, you may be able to do that for anything. You could, you could, also, take, you, you could also put anything into ASMJS as well. Um, so this is going to really open things up for a lot of people. Um, and all of this is going to lead to even higher performance in the browser, so I'm excited about that. Um, 2015 as well, ES6 was renamed to ES2015, so I guess that makes ES7, ES2016. Uh, okay, but so the, the thinking behind that is that so basically they're like, okay, so if we don't meet the deadline, we're just going to release what we have, and anything that's not complete, we're not going to release. So that will go into the next ES8 or the ES2018, ES2019, and so forth. Um, whether they do that, I guess we'll see. ES2015 was approved uh, on the 17th, which was what, eight days ago? 25 minus eight, 17, yeah. So, like, this is fresh stuff right here. Um, so, a lot of browsers, and, and especially IOJS, they have already implemented quite a lot of ES6. Spider Monkey, especially, has most of ES6 implemented. Um, but uh, in terms of developing in ES6, ES5 was pretty easy because you could polyfill most of it. Um, you could just jam something on, a, on, on an array prototype and, and make all the browsers work. ES6 has uh, syntax extensions. So you can't just write ES6 code and think it'll be fine. So you have to transpile it, which is just a fancy way of saying compiling you know, from one version to another of the language. Um, and you're going to probably need to do that for node modules as well, because uh, you might have people using node 10, uh, so they're going to want to be able to use your module. Uh, so that's going to be a thing. What about the future? Well, the future for me is Soylent. <laughs> because, um, has anyone heard of Soylent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting project. I have a month's worth coming in um, soon, it's, it's on its way. And uh, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to feel healthier, and uh, I'm going to look like this. <laughs> That's the future me, right there. Um, I would also have to shave off all my body hair. <laughs> and get some, get some, uh, some uh, underwear that goes above my trousers. And get a, one of those, what is that, like a thing around my neck. In script 6 then, uh, there's still implementing, implementing to be done. Um, Chrome, Firefox, and IOJS are pretty much the latest kind of support. Um, as I said, we've got transpilers. Um, ES6 brings us let and const, which is block scoping. So you're probably going to see uh, some new styles of, of, of JavaScript uh, coming out. Um, whether or not they're good or not, I don't know. Um, they, they may initially add more confusion for people, actually. Because uh, they'll see a let and they'll see a var, and then they might use a var where they need to use a let, and then they'll have a function that returns the, the current value of a variable of a variable instead of the value that they thought it was in the loop, and all that kind of stuff. Um, promises and generators. Anyone have generators? Oh, yeah, generators are really cool. Um, talk about that in a minute. Uh, MScript six also brings us classes. Uh, which I'm not sure I'm actually totally on board with. Um, again, uh, you know, having this, this prototypal nature and everything and, and, and emphasizing that would have been nice. Um, we already have new, which is kind of confused people. This might confuse me even more if they come into the language and go, oh, it has classes. It doesn't have classes really. It has a class like <laughs> syntax that basically resolved down the prototypal inheritance. So, like, is that the best thing? I don't know. It, it will help with adoption from, for people from other languages. It also has modules, and again, I'm not that happy with the, with the outcome of that, but what can you do? Um, I, I feel that the, the module system in Node, CommonJS, is so simple and so nice, uh, and then they've gone and done this thing where you have to like import thingy thingy uh, as thingy, uh, and then you, you, know, you have to... Um, if, you, if you, you have to export a default thing instead of just exporting a thing, um, if, you, if, if I just so if I export foo, 
when I, when I import the module, I have to import the module and then I have to look up the property foo on the module and import it. Um, if I want to export just foo, then I have to export foo and say it's the default thing instead of being a property. Um, this, is, this is much more complicated to me than just like saying module export equals function uh, and uh, require a file. Um, the, exam, the, the advantage sorry, of modules though is um, static analysis. Uh, there's a great article by uh, um, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier um, on Tuality, his website, about the advantage of static analysis of modules. But if that's, if that's all there is to it, then I'm, I'm probably not going to be using that much myself. Um, although I'm open to change my mind. We also have uh, the spread operator and the rest operator. Uh, we have destructuring, uh, lambdas, so you have the fat arrows, uh, lambdas, which will also be interesting because now, as, along with people not naming their functions, you're now not going to be able to name your functions because lambdas are not named. So I'm wondering how that's going to work out with debugging. Um, let me just show you real quick uh, the, the deal with generators. So to get this effect, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, using some of the similar technology that Chrome uses to do Chromecasting, and I'm broadcasting that window um, into a video element on the presentation, which is really cool. Um, so a generator is basically a function, but it has a star in it, like this. And you can return from, from these just like you can with functions, but you can also yield from them. So I can yield one, yield, foo, return, a, um, sorry, I put the star in the wrong place. So then, when I call that function, it gives me an iterator. And the iterator um, has a property called next. And that, that allows me to step through that function. So I can control the flow of the function externally. So when I call next, it gives me an object with a value of 1 and dump false. So because the first value I yield is 1. Uh, the second time I call it, the value will be foo, that will be false. And then the last one, uh, the value is hey, because that's what I return. And it'll say done is true. Um, okay, so why is that awesome? Well, basically, because you can control the function externally, um, you can uh, do asynchronous things externally, uh, which means you can hook up an environment where you can, you can yield asynchronous operations from inside your generator and then not take the next step until that asynchronous operation completes, um, which allows you to write asynchronous code in a synchronous style. And, um, a framework that's done that, has been done it, doing it for some time, um, is called uh, Code, C-O. So if I get a browser window up here and just show you very quickly. So this is Code. It's, um, it was originally by TJ Holloway Chuck. You heard of him? The guy that wrote Express and about a million other things before he was like, no, it sucks, and went off and did go. Um, no, it's, it's really good, I love the stuff that he's worked on. Um, so with code, you have this, this CO function. Um, uh, and you, you basically yield promises from it. And then the result of that function is a promise that gives you the final value that you return uh, from it. Uh, so, What's really nice about this is it allows you to, it, it gives you like a construct for pa doing parallel operations uh, without, so, without uh, having callbacks all over the place. So I can have, I have three promises and I can yield them in an array. And when I yield an array, it runs those three promises in parallel. Or, or I can yield one, one promise on its own and then yield another two in parallel and so on and so forth. So this gives me a really nice way to, to do this different stuff. Problems with this 
as like I said, um, if you're writing something in, with this sort of this sort of style, um, you're going to have to transpile it because the ES6 and the star and yield are, are invalid syntax in the ES5 and below. So that's okay, but but generators transpiling a generator uh, is is pretty bad at the minute because the the things that they have to do to make that work is very heavy lifting. Now that may or may not be a problem depending on what you're doing because um, you could make the argument that even if the abstraction that controls the asynchronous flow is heavy, if it's not greater than your asynchronous operations, then it's not the bottleneck and it doesn't matter. Um, you got to weigh it up. Um, so, yeah, really interesting, but something that I, I would consider using generators for is writing tests. I think they'd be really nice in, in, in writing tests, particularly if you have a lot of asynchronous things to do, because you could write them very cleanly. Um, or, although promises will pretty much give you the same kind of deal. In EverScript 7, possibly 2016, uh, they're looking at implementing an async await, which will pretty much do away with the whole thing about, you know, strong arming generators into write synchronous style code, so we'll just throw all that away and we'll use async await. Um, they're also looking at putting guards into the language. So a guard is basically a primitive that allows you to enforce arbitrary constraints uh, on pieces of the language, and, and with those you can build your own type and primitives. So instead of enforcing types, this is really nice, I like this, because instead of forcing types onto the language, which is going to be like a split down the middle issue for many people, um, they just, they're just going to say, here's the primitives that you can use to enforce your own types if you want to. Like it. Um, and, and, and that approach, plus that thing they're going to do in, in ES8, which I'll talk about in a second, is an approach which they've taken from ES5. But ES7 as well, they're also going to look at event loop concurrency. So, um, what we currently do with microservices is we have Effectively, we have multiple event loops, and we pass messages between those event loops, right? Um, in the browser, we would use something like a web worker to give us another event loop, that we, and we pass messages between them. But what they're going to look at doing is a standardized way of sharing state between event loops. Um, so that could be very interesting. Um, they're not going to use the thread paradigm at all. Uh, they're going to do something different. Uh, in the future future, um, ESA, uh, they're looking at putting in macros, which is really nice. I like that because that, that kind of goes back to the days of Scheme. Because um, Scheme was a dialect of Lisp, right? And another dialect of Lisp was Common Lisp. And here's how they were different. Common Lisp was like throwing all the, th all the features, throwing all the things. Whereas Scheme was like just make a really, really small thing and make it really easy extendable. So then you can just write macros to extend the language and you build basically your own extension to Scheme for your, for your thing that you want to do. If they'd have done macros prior to ES6, ES6 could have been built in macros and a lot of the things that they wanted to put in, they may have like made optional and like, okay, if you want it, just turn on this macro or whatever. Um, and that would have been awesome because something that I'm now concerned about is, is ECMAScript going to go in the direction where we just keep throwing features onto it so that when someone comes to learn it, they're like, this language is infinite and I'm just going to like learn a very small piece of it. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, would, would have in the past prevented me from learning other languages because I'd be like, oh man, like PHP for instance, it's like, how, how much does, how far does this go? Um, so there's like this line where a language becomes too big to, and it doesn't, once it passes that line, it might as well be infinite. Um, but what JavaScript was really amazing at was you could master it in, in, in a fairly, maybe in a year, year and a half, you could get really good at it and learn and work with the subtleties of it. Um, and, and I'd be concerned in, in, in the future that that's not going to be as easy to do. Um, for people like us, we have an advantage because we already know it pretty well and we're going to learn these new things and we're like, yeah, yeah, I can use the stuff. Um, but even, even at that, I'm probably not going to use all of it. I'm probably not going to use classes. Um, I might play with them, but I'm probably not going to use them. Um, 
So that's my rant. But uh, another thing in ESA is uh, they're going to look at SIMD, uh, single instruction multiple data. So you can basically process arrays in parallel. Um, and that will be uh, like a really complementary thing to that whole idea of WebAssembly as well. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, this is what I'm going to look out, look like in the future future. Um, when we've all taken wearables too far, I've got my Google Glasses, I've got my Mayo, uh, I've got my heart rate monitor, uh, what else have I got? I've got my Apple Watch, um, I've got my uh, soiling injection system straight into the bloodstream. Uh, and I think that's, that's the end of the talk, so thank you for your time. Questions? Great, great, cool. Okay. <laughs> now, has anyone got anything before we, before we wrap up? Uh, <coughs> what do you think about uh, web assembly? Is it, uh, sorry, my friend. Oh, my name is Sergey. And uh, what do you think about uh, web assembly? Could it kill JavaScript? Because if we just start to develop everything, uh, let's say in Java or C sharp or right. whatever. Right. Um, I don't think I don't think it's, if it if it ever does, it's going to be a long time coming. Uh, WebAssembly is going to take a while to even get into the browsers, and um, probably maybe five years, five ten years. Something like that. I don't think it's going to be the JavaScript killer um, because there's plenty of power in JavaScript. Um, it might. It, the, what you're saying is that it would, if you've got a stack from in Java, you'll be like, well, we'll just compile it and put it into the browser. And that, that's, that's a lot about what that's for. Um, but no, I don't think it's going to wipe out JavaScript by any means. I think there's plenty of room in, in the pool. Um, but it will mean that you can pretty much choose the language that you, that you prefer. And I would still choose JavaScript, and I would still go on JavaScript myself. What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just also like uh, JavaScript, but uh, I'm just starting to be afraid of it. Well, in the future, JavaScript uh, uh, went out, uh, got, goes out from the development, like Flash, when uh, sure. Apple just decided to, to not support the Flash. Yeah. It's go out three years, yeah. four years, Thank you. that's it. By the way, Flash Action, Action Script 3 was essentially an implementation of ES4. Um, so, I'm kind of glad. <laughs> but, yeah, no, you have a good point, but we'll have to wait and see. It will be good anyway. The, th the thing is that the extensions that they're making to the language at the minute with ES6 and stuff as well, it's probably going to make it not as contentious to not use JavaScript or not use JavaScript anyway. Um, I don't know, there might be some reasons to use JavaScript, particularly for legacy as well, like older browsers. And you know what it's like with the browser world, you've got to support older browsers for a long time, although that is speeding up. Um, and so and the other thing is server-side JavaScript play. Like, like if, if it was just if we only use JavaScript because of the browser, then Node wouldn't be popular. So there's there's value in JavaScript inherently, not just because of its positioning. Well let's see. We'll see. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. What are your thoughts on TypeScript? You what are my thoughts on TypeScript? TypeScript? That's funny because I, I delivered this in. The, the question was, what are my thoughts on TypeScript? Um, which is funny because I, I delivered this uh, in, in London two days ago and I had exactly the same question. What are your thoughts on TypeScript? Look, I, I think that um, if you come from a C sharp background, TypeScript is really nice for you because, like, there's a lot of similarities between it. Um, if you if you come, if you if you have a Microsoft environment and you use Visual Studio and IntelliSense, TypeScript is nice for that. Um, but the, the problem that they're solving, I mean, they put a lot of effort into solving a problem that's not really a massive deal, um, which is the, the whole type safety. So essentially, TypeScript to me works for like a type linter with extra annotations. Um, I've been using JavaScript since I was 12, um, and it's never really been a big deal. Like once or twice, learning the language, maybe more than once or twice. 
I had a NAND because I wasn't checking for a number and things like that. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it needs to be solved in that way. Uh, and the other problem with TypeScript is its ecosystem. So um, to be able to benefit from the value of TypeScript, if you're using a library that's written in JavaScript, you need a DTS file. Things called a DTS file. Um, and so, say you use jQuery, you need a DTS file for jQuery to get the benefit from using the jQuery API. Um, but the problem is, there's more than one version of jQuery, right? The way that the, the, the repository works for uh, DTS is there's only ever one version of the repository. So you, you go and, 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 and download, uh, there's like a little command line uh, thing that you can get that, that DTS file, and it might be the wrong version. And then you'll have errors, lint error, TypeScript errors, um, because it's the wrong version. So then you have to go and modify it yourself. So that there is a problem with the ecosystem, I think. Um, but some people have built on TypeScript, and, and hopefully they're feeding into the, into the system. I wouldn't use it myself, but I do appreciate the value of it for certain people. That's one thing I know is that the, um, the new version of Angular, Angular 2.0, is going to use TypeScript. Yes. yes. Which indicates it's getting some traction. Yeah. Yeah, no, you'd be right to think about that. Um, but, so, so, the thing is, TypeScript is pretty much ECMAScript 6 with their extra type annotations. And what Angular was going to do was they were going to use ECMAScript 6 and have their own type safety system. And for what they're doing and the, the way that they want to do it, they obviously want to use type safety. Um, and it might make uh, implementation details easier for them uh, at the end of the day as well. So, the, the thing with TypeScript as well, uh, hopefully by version 2, it will be mainly optional. So when you run that build, you, you don't have to have all of the type things. So when you run that build process, it will just say, hey, you, you set this to a string, now you change it to a number. Did you really want to do that? And I think there's value in that. I think there's value in that, but not having a strict type system. Mm. Thank you. Mm. That's, uh, when you build an like, enterprise client-side JavaScript apps, would you say Angular is a good choice, or I like Angular. Angular. I think Angular is a great choice, um, but it does depend on your project. Uh, so, just in case anyone didn't hear that, is Angular a good choice for JavaScript enterprise applications? Um, and depend really depends on the size of the project and uh, developer experience um, and what people believe that the experience would be of developers going forward. Um, the, one of the main selling points of Ember to a lot of companies is that everything that you do with it, your, your processes and the way that you work with it, is predetermined. So you, you can jump from one Ember project to another and they all look the same, which is really nice. With Angular, you don't get that. With Angular, you basically have to figure out how are we going to put this together. Um, but it's been around for a while now that there's some good practices on how to do that. You can, you can research and find out the good practices. Yes, that's a little bit more work. The thing that put me off Ember in the first place was the way that it that it worked with objects. You had to like cool get and set methods and stuff like that. I haven't looked at Ember for a while, but I don't believe you have to do that anymore. I think you can just work with objects directly. So that kind of makes it a stronger contender as well. Can I jump in there? Because yes, um, yes, you're like the Ember dude, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. So I'm uh, I work here at Intercom, and we're heavy Ember users. So like we've got probably 35 developers working in the Ember codebase, and we looked at Angular, but we we didn't like that it didn't have those strong conventions, mm -hmm. so that's why for us Ember makes total sense, because mm -hmm. we hire these new people, and, and even several projects, different teams, we all know exactly how the codebase works, right. um, and you're saying about get and set, right. um, they've recently dropped support for IE8, oh, yeah, so that's going to be on the way. So, I see. And um, so that's going to be Ember 2 or whenever cool. we actually drop that. But for large teams, I definitely yeah. recommend Ember and I guess even the, the wider ecosystem. Yeah. Because like with build tools and kind of you have React and that kind of solves the view part. Whereas Ember has, you know, um, I guess, uh, like back button and routing, all this sort of stuff. So. Yeah, that's so I would be interested as well to see, again with Angular 2, whether they're going to actually introduce stronger conventions or not. Um, and it's a double-edged sword though, because 
you know, if, if you do have those strong conventions, you don't have the flexibility necessarily to do things that you might be looking to do. I built, I built a, 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 a project in Angular, um, but I wasn't working with a team. I was working just as a freelance developer on doing a single project. And when I chose, I chose it. I chose Angular over Ember for those reasons that I can do. I can actually work with it the way I want to work with it, um, and I have more scope. And um, it was a successful project, um, but all of the knowledge for that project is in my head. <laughs> um, so he rings me up every now and again. Um, React is another. You brought up React there. Uh, is another contender and. Um, there's a large company in New York that was using Ember and has now moved over to React for, and they, they maintain hundreds of websites. Um, I haven't looked at React enough to know what, what made them make that choice. I think it was mainly performance. Ah, right. Because Ember traditionally does have a problem with massive lists. Right. And they're trying, so they've actually re-implemented the Viewler, and now that's it's actually using kind of a dom diffing, which React may think. Right, so it's the same so actually, Yeah, so they've redone yeah. that. So that's, it's, it's not even there yet, it's in beta. Um, it should be coming in the next two months or something like that. Lovely. Um, so React is mainly a view there, and it doesn't, so it doesn't kind of talk about how your data kind of flows around the whole app. And people have talked about Flux, so Flux is basically mm -hmm. an idea. Mm -hmm. But all these different people have implemented different ways of doing flux, and there's all these different competing standards. Mm -hmm. But Ember, like, tells you how to how this flow, how data flow through your app. So mm -hmm. we don't need to discuss this. We don't need to have bytes shared about yeah. all this sort of stuff that's already there. Yeah. Um, another thing that I heard a rumor about, but I, I haven't verified it, is they may be looking at extending. Um, Hopefully not the JavaScript language. Hopefully the browser environment, so that it actually acts like an Angular or an Ember, or it has this data binding and it has the, the you know reactive kind of elements to it. Um, they better not put that in ECMAScript because then I might move to another language because that's just a stupid thing to do. Um, but it, it would be interesting to see how the newer features like Object Observe, I don't know if you've heard of Object Observe, that would really feed into this um, whole whole area. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Ember might be better for teams. Can I ask a question then on Ember? Yeah. So when you're developing, uh, even when you're part of a team developing Ember applications, how <laughs> much do you kind of do spend writing job, pure JavaScript code as opposed to you know Ember specific mm -hmm. code? Well, if you like. well, it is. It is Ember. Or it, it is JavaScript. Yeah. Like you're, like, so, like recently for the we. Undertook like a massive project where we've written a basically an editor in, um, in JavaScript, but most of that was just written in pure JavaScript, and um, because we couldn't use Ember, because so like we, we use Ember to give us all the eventing of like when stuff happens, but most of it like all the DOM stuff and like it, it, you can drop so it gives you all these release files that you have follow all these conventions, but if you need to break out with it, you can. So like for you know, you can pull in any, if you want jQuery plugins and just wrap them, you know, to kind of make them work with the Ember environment or something like that. But generally, you're just trying to JavaScript. So they've aligned themselves heavily with ES6. They're like the first major library to bring um, translation of like uh, ES6 modules. So that's been, in, we've been writing ES6 modules like for like a year and a half now. And so, like you go to Cats, and Stephen Penner there, like on TC39. So, like they align themselves with um, TC39 and even some like components. So, yeah, it's still JavaScript, but obviously the, it's opinionated. But I think it works, works for us. Thank you. Anyone else? Pizza? Pizza, yeah. Yeah. Can we eat a pizza now? <laughs>